and, you know, you're okay, and then all of a sudden, you have to find a place. You know, it's tough. Tonight, elders and Prince Rupert face an uncertain future. I know there's a lot of, of mistrust when it comes with policing and, you know, I might stand alone on this, but you know what, if I don't, you know, I can't come out of a place of hatred, you know, I, in order to heal. Plus, a grieving mother sees a glimpse of hope. Expectations for Canada to intervene on several files is what our ask is, and we've received no momentum or movement on any of the files. And the Mohawk Council of Ganawage expresses frustration as Parliament resumes. Hello, good evening, Tansi Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The bail hearing for Nathan Chasing Horse was postponed today. The Sioux actor of Dances with Wolves fame was arrested last week, but has yet to be formally charged. He appeared briefly in a Las Vegas courtroom. Chasing Horse remains in custody while he searches for a new lawyer. He's expected to face charges of sex trafficking and sexual assault dating back to the early 2000s. News of his, of his arrest hit the powwow circuit in the U.S. and Canada particularly hard. Chasing Horse had attended many powwows over the years, portraying himself as a medicine man. Last week, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan banned Chasing Horse from attending any Federation events. Authorities have indicated there may be more charges as the investigation unfolds. It was a bittersweet news for the family of Ashley Shingoose. DNA provided by her relatives did not match that of an alleged victim of a Winnipeg serial killer, the victim known only as Buffalo Woman. 31-year-old Ashley Shingoose from St. Teresa Point has been missing since March 11th of 2022. Her family gave DNA to Winnipeg police recently to try to match Buffalo Woman. She is considered to be the fourth alleged victim of serial killer Jeremy Skibicki, who was charged late last year. Albert Chingus told APTN the DNA did not match. Winnipeg police will not confirm the information, saying in an email, the results are considered private information that may be shared. The missing person unit investigation of Ashley Shingus is continuing, and the homicide investigation of Buffalo Woman is also ongoing. The family of a BC man who died in RCMP custody says there's a measure of comfort with the arrest of five officers in connection to his death, even though it is now almost six years later. Dale Culver of the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en Nations died in Prince George RCMP custody after having trouble breathing. An independent investigation in 2019 found Culver was pepper sprayed during a struggle with officers. RCMP were responding to a man allegedly casing vehicles at the time. Culver's daughter says they should not have had to wait this long. In any other circumstances, if the roles were reversed, it wouldn't have taken this long. And if that were my dad sitting in the hot seat, it would have been dealt with already in that it, like, it, there would have been no question about it. He would have been arrested on the spot and held in custody until the hearing and the trials. Two officers face mans manslaughter charges and three face obstruction of justice charges. Their next court appearances are March the 14th. And in British Columbia, over 30 people in Prince Rupert are facing evictions from their homes. And a group of elders says their building does need repairs, but they have nowhere to go. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. Ronald Shaw is a Simshian elder an Indian Day School survivor who has lived with his wife in the 6th Avenue apartments for 20 years. He says his wife is in a wheelchair and it is important they are close to the hospital. In December, he got a phone call from the new owner of his building. They were being evicted because the building needed renovations. It's a tough world to live in, really. When, you know, you're okay and then all of a sudden you have to find a place, you know. It's tough. Sheila Eli and her late husband lived in the same apartment for 17 years. The tenants in 6th Avenue 
will have until the end of April to move out. Deborah, speaking for her sister, says rentals in Prince Rupert are nearly $2,000. It's unaffordable. It's impossible for an elder on their income to get a rental here. There, it's totally impossible. There's no way. There is no way. In 2001, the BC government passed legislation to stop illegal renovations. They require landlords to prove repairs would require a vacant property with a residential tenancy branch. Since December, Prince Rupert Unemployment Action Centre, a legal advocacy organization, has been working on more than 30 evictions in Prince Rupert. They say landlords at 6th Avenue and Harborview Apartments have both gone through the correct process with the residential tenancy branch and also agreed to compensate the tenants between $2,000 and $4,000, which was not required. The tenants are still in a difficult situation. There are no rentals. I've been looking since the building went up for sale, and that's over a year ago, and there's been nothing. I phoned real estate people, Tinker Realty, and she has nothing. I got friends that are looking for me, and there is nothing. And if there is something, I can't afford it by myself. In an email statement to AP10 News, the Ministry of Housing said they empathize with tenants in Prince Rupert and across the province. To help address the housing needs of the Prince Rupert community, BC Housing is working closely with its partners to bring affordable rental townhomes and apartments through the Harborview Gardens redevelopment. Ronald Shaw says the Prince Rupert Unemployment Action Center is working with them and they hope to find a place in a senior care home. Help us fill in uh, papers to get a place down at Sunset Villa. That's the uh, only suitable place for us somewhere here in town. The evicted tenants in Prince Rupert all want the same thing, an affordable and safe place to move to. It's a safe apartment, a safe building complexes to be available for the situations like this because yeah. it happens. The construction date of Prince Rupert for the affordable housing complex is scheduled for now to 2024 and we'll see 192 new homes. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Prince Rupert. Something positive may have come out of the death of Chantel Moore. Edmonston, New Brunswick police shot and killed Moore in June of 2020 during a wellness check. Now, police in Victoria, British Columbia, have launched a new program to make wellness checks safer. Angel Moore reports on how Chantel's mother has given her approval. For the last three years, Martha Martin has fought for justice after her daughter, Chantel Moore, was fatally shot during a wellness check. Martin's calls to change policing were finally answered by the Victoria Police Department. Your police department is and getting our head start of, you know, and I hope this has a ripple effect going out towards, you know, the country because it's badly needed. The new co-response team is called CRT. It pairs a mental health practitioner with a police officer to respond to wellness checks. A Victoria Police News release states that officers with CRT have specialized training in responding to and supporting people through client-centered, trauma-informed approaches and de-escalation. Victoria Police Chief Dalmanic further said, Which is mental health calls where people are either in mental health crisis or they're having a mental health episode and they need intervention is not criminal in nature. Let's just admit that. They're not criminal. Um, these are health issues. Manic described an incident that shows how the CRT team is already a success. And it turned out they were out of their medication and they needed medication. We're able to make a phone call while the person is at their residence, get their prescription filled, deliver their prescription, and we didn't have to take them to the hospital. Chantal Moore's death led to public outrage and rallies across the country. And last year, a coroner's inquest in New Brunswick found Moore's death a homicide. It was emotionally devastating for Moore's family. But Martin says she's ready to heal. We're going in the right direction where, you know, it's a start towards, you know, mending these bridges between policing and, you know, I know there's a lot of, of mistrust when it comes with policing and, you know, I might stand alone on this, but you know what, if I don't, you know, I can't come out of a place of hatred, you know, I, in order to heal, you know. APTN News asked the Edmondson police if they considered a similar project. 
Edmonston Police Chief Steve Robinson was unavailable for an interview, but their communications director said the New Brunswick's police departments already work with the province's mobile crisis unit. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. All right, it's time to step aside for a short break, but still to come, Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand weighs in on MMF cards being recognized as official ID. Welcome back to APTN National News. As Parliament resumes sitting, the Mohawk Council of Ganawage is not optimistic that their interests will be represented by the Trudeau government. A recent meeting with the Justice Minister has led the Council to believe the Feds aren't listening. Amelia Fournier has more. Despite the Liberals' promises of reconciliation, Michael DeLille Jr. of the Mohawk Council of Ganawage, or MCK, says that the government still doesn't seem to be listening. Don't say reconciliation. Don't say implementation of UNDRIP. Don't say all of these truth and reconciliation, strength and authorities, and all of these things without real recognition. And the only way to get there is dialogue at the table with the people that it affects on a daily basis. DeLille Jr. has been in politics for over 20 years. He says the council's mid-January meeting with Justice Minister David Lametti left MCK disappointed, but not surprised. Frustrating to say in a word, but uh, also I'll say disappointing. Expectations for Canada to intervene on several files is what our ask is, and we've received no momentum or movement on any of the files that we're engaged with. 
These files include their online gaming industry and fighting Quebec's most recent French language bill. Ganawage has been an online gaming regulator and host for the past 20 years. Lametti had promised the next time the criminal code was amended, First Nations would finally get legal recognition of their jurisdiction. But when it was amended in 2021, First Nations were left out, leaving the provinces as the sole online gaming regulator. You don't ask for recognition, you exercise jurisdiction. And we've done it successfully, you know, to the tune of hundreds of millions over the course of 20 plus years. Yet. Canada and Ontario has now finally, in their opinion, found a way to try and shut us out. Ontario is demanding MCK pay taxes and register with the province, so MCK is taking Ontario to court. We're really hanging by a thread here in terms of protecting the jurisdiction, and we're not giving up, thus the fight. At this year's meeting, DeLille Jr. said Lametti didn't have a plan to assist MCK in their fight for online gaming jurisdiction. If the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada doesn't see fit to have dialogue or intervene at some point in time on some of these, like I said, in your face issues that are facing us today. How can we have faith moving forward in the implementation of UNDRIP? Lametti's office declined APTN's request for interview or comment. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Ganawage. Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand is applauding a move by the government of Manitoba to recognize MMF citizenship cards as official ID. The change comes after Manitoba Métis were being denied services at liquor, cannabis and lottery retailers within the province. The province acknowledged that the card does have security features that align with other cards already approved as primary identification. Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand says the issue is bigger than just ID at retail stores. It really uh, sets the stage of truly uh, giving pride to the Métis citizens again to identify themselves as a Métis citizen with its own card to its own government, its own nation. And I think that really is the pathway to uh, reconciliation and respect, United Nations Declaration, all of these things that we have pushed so hard to achieve and yet we're still asking people to recognize our cards in our province, which I think is quite backwards. We've got more news coming up when we come back. A wrap on the Arctic Winter Games.
friends, welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo was submitted by Beale Kwok. Beale shared this lone back road leading into the forest at a base of a hill as the sun begins to set. Be sure to leave a clear dark sky in its wake. Thanks so much for that, Beale. We want to see your photos so you can send them to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, zero degrees in St. John's and zero in Halifax. Minus 15 in Clear and Cartwright and minus 11 in Kujawak. Minus 6 in Quebec City and zero degrees in Snow and Val d'Or. 7 degrees in Toronto and 12 in Sarnia. Zero degrees in Snow and Wawa and minus 1 in Thunder Bay. Minus 25 in Churchill and minus 11 in God's Lake. Minus 6 in Snow and Barrens River and minus 1 in Winnipeg. 3 degrees in Saskatoon and 2 in North Battleford. 4 degrees in Buffalo Narrows and minus 9 in Uranium City. Starting the move west, the minus 2 in Snow and High Level and minus 1 in Peace River. 4 degrees in Edmonton and 7 in Calgary. 8 degrees in Vancouver and 4 in Quesnel. 5 degrees in Sandspit and clear in minus 7 in Fort Nelson. Minus 18 in Beaver Creek and minus 21 in Rock River. Snow in minus 23 in Norman Wells and clear in minus 1 in Fort Liard. Minus 31 in Fort McPherson and minus 26 in Colville Lake. Minus 34 in some sun and cloud in Cambridge Bay and minus 32 in Chesterfield. Minus 35 in Snow and Resolute and minus 31 in the Calouet. Ojibwe artist Jackie Travers is seeing her fabric designs being snapped up across Turtle Island. APTN Sav Jonesa went to her studio to see where she comes up with her beautiful ideas. Yellow, turquoise, and even lavender are some of the bright colors adorned with floral motifs in a new fabric line designed by Jackie Travers. Aptly named Ojibwe Florals, Travers has a strong vision for their use. Ribbon skirts, of course, exactly, and ribbon shirts and star blankets and little dresses for little girls, shirts for boys. I want to see Indigenous people wearing them. Born and raised in Winnipeg, the multidisciplined Ojibwe artist from Lake St. Martin First Nation is well known for her bold, colorful paintings. But she says designing fabrics has always been her dream. I've been wanting to do fabrics for for like 10 years. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a designer, right? And that just never happened for me. Um, I kind of shifted towards being a painter. I wanted to be an artist after that. Painting led her to a fine arts education where her style and culture wasn't always respected. But she says that's how she knew she was doing something right. Art school, just before I graduated, they hated them at my critiques. They put them down, they just didn't, and I was like, I'm on to something. She has since had many milestones, like designing this stamp for Canada Post's Truth and Reconciliation series. It's just kind of in me, like I just always want to be creating, I always want to be painting or making something. It just, it's very healing. It was during the pandemic when she realized her dream of working in textiles, thanks to the surge and people and learning how to like sew. That. So during the pandemic, like I, which I, pretty much gave up on ever having my own fabric line. I started making appliques. So I started using my artwork and put it, getting them printed on uh, fabric and figured this way people can put my artwork on the front of their ribbon skirts. And they became really popular. Her work got the attention of Siltex, a textile supplier she had contact with a decade prior. Thanks to their partnership, Traverse's fabric and ribbon designs are now available in over 50 stores across Canada and the United States. I was like blown away that people really wanted to buy the fabric. You know, people were excited and um, when I posted it, I got a lot of comments, a lot of questions and and Celtic said the fabrics are selling really well. So that makes me happy. 
and the demand is huge, becoming the most anticipated pre-order in Siltec's history. 90% of it sold out before stock even arrived, and work is already underway for her next designs. When we create the next uh, line of fabrics, we want to have some butterflies and some dragonflies and maybe some ladybugs and hummingbirds. Until then, Travers continues working on her art, something yeah, she never okay. wants to stop. I always feel like uh, time is fleeting, so I should always be creating. I want to do as much as I can, leave as much as I can for my, my children and my grandchildren. Sab Jonesa, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The 2023 Arctic Winter Games wrapped up on the weekend after a week of competition at Wood Buffalo, Alberta. APTN's Chris Stewart was at Saturday's closing ceremonies. <laughs> It was one last chance to celebrate the 2023 Arctic Winter Games. The last chance for athletes from the North to get together and celebrate their accomplishments and listen to stories from new friends. The Games lived up to their billing with sold out seating and high level competition. many cultural exhibitions for visitors to see. It was Team Yukon who won the games. The team led with 61 gold ulus and 169 total medals, beating second place Alaska. And Yukon really punched above their weight with a population of 44,000 people versus Alaska's near three quarters of a million. The host, Team Alberta North, finished in third with 42 gold ulus and 144 total medals. The athletes, coaches, officials, dignitaries, and fans celebrated the game's closing with music and dance. The games left a lasting memory for those here. We've had a, a great time. I had a granddaughter in futsal, and then we spent a lot of time at Arctic Sports, and uh, yeah, we got around, saw lots of stuff. It's great. Pretty well done. It's been great. It's yeah. so fun. There's lots of people we've, we've met, lots of people uh, we see from Nunavut, and it's so good to see them again. Yeah. We have a niece, a great niece, um, she was competing in the girls' basketball team, so we came down to watch her play. My son competed in uh, table tennis. He won two silver medals and a bronze medal for Team Nunavut. How proud of you! Super proud. I cried tears for three days straight. I think I'm done crying now. <laughs> the 2024 Arctic Winter Games will be held in Anchorage, Alaska. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Fort McMurray, Alberta. Well, it was so nice to see the games back, and we will certainly look forward to the next Arctic Winter Games. All right, that's all we have for you tonight for this February 6th edition of APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. For all of us here, thank you so much for joigning us. Miigwech, and have a great night.